All right, so thank you for having me here. So I'm going to talk about communicating your science, and I also want to say a little bit about who I am. I am not a vet. I am not in agriculture. I actually study science communication, so that's my research. So it's an interdisciplinary social scientific field. I happen to be in a journalism department, but my colleagues are from lots of other departments. Um, but we look at how scientific information is communicated to various audiences, how audiences interpret scientific information, and then the effects of communication practices upon understanding, acceptance, and support. So quick, I'm going to throw a couple tips at you to say how we can cut through the noise, navigate the maze, all the things we're talking about. So when you are communicating with a non-expert, someone who is from outside your field, could be the public, here are three tips. Number one, avoid jargon. So science uses words that often mean nothing to the non-expert. Parts per million and parts per billion, we know they're very different, but most people think it's about the same, it means small. Um, unmetabolized, I mean all these words that are used often mean nothing. So try and describe your science only using words that are frequently used by your audience. Number two, analogies and metaphors can be very powerful. So if you have a complex topic, you can describe it through something else that is known that is familiar. So antibiotics are like a military boot camp training germs to get stronger. It's not really what it is, but it's close enough that you, you get that sense of what's, what's coming. And number three, narrative examples. So if you can provide specific cases of something happening, you place those abstract ideas into something more concrete, and it increases relevance. So instead of saying antimicrobial resistance is a serious threat to public health, which is true, but that's a general abstraction, you could bring it down to a story and say Robert should have recovered quickly from his surgery, but MRSA had other plans. So now we're talking about a very specific individual. So. How can you use these tips? Well, you can give scientific presentations, make data available, publish in diverse media, blah, 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 blah. This is my critique, is often we get to this point. You, get, you have some tips about how to communicate well, and then it is go forth and do all these things. So I first want to take a step back to say there's actually a lot more that science communication is about. That's why it's called What Is It Really About? Um, and I want to go back to, first of all, what is the model that you have in your head for how science communication works. So chances are, it's something like this. This is probably the default mode that people think of um, when they don't really think about it. It's called the transition model. Um, it focuses on transmission of facts. So it starts with one on the left. You're the expert, you have facts and information that you want your audience to know, and it goes through the transmitter, the channel, receiver, this whole pathway, until it gets to the audience, and you wanna take that fact, and you wanna push it into their head. So, um, the two uh, slidos before, the thing you said that we need a lot of work on is consumer education. Is this the model you had in your mind for consumer education? That you have knowledge that they don't, and I'm gonna try and push it through all these channels and get there? Okay, so this is what a lot of people think of, and it turns out, oh, actually, here's some examples. If you do, do a quick search about science communication issues, you see a lot about facts. So this is just one I found, 10 common GMO claims debunked. It's about facts. This is from Iowa State, I'm from Iowa State. Um, there was a story about agriculture in the student newspaper. And there was an agriculture student that did not like what was said, and so started this online petition to try and say that student fees should not go towards the school newspaper because of all this. And what I want you to see is why this person said it wasn't <coughs> acceptable. So we have, it's not factual truth. Uh, we want to see more factual-based agriculture. If you look in the comments as to why people were signing this petition, you see it all over the place. I'm tired of reading unfactual liberal hypocrisy that is the ISU Daily. Educate, correct information, non-factual, incorrect knowledge. You see this over and over again. There's this idea of facts that we're gonna push it over there. This is also called the deficit model of science communication. So science generates knowledge. We have to get it to society. If there are controversies under this model, it's caused by a deficit of knowledge, so the role of communication is to educate the audience, reduce the controversy, and then everything will be fine. Um, there's an assumption that the facts will speak for themselves. Okay, lots of studies show that this is not a very accurate portrayal of how science communication works. There is, there is a very thin ribbon of context when it is effective, but it's very thin. Usually it does not work. and. It turns out that knowledge and attitudes about science are really not correlated. 
So more knowledge, if there's something that's important to someone, more knowledge leads to greater politicization. So if you look at the people who are the farthest apart on attitudes, they know the most about the science. And they're, they're right. They know a lot of science, but it's going in a complete different direction. The reason is that knowledge is important, but it is uninterpretable until you apply it to an underlying value system. And it's the application that drives the attitudes, behaviors, and acceptance. So science describes and explains the world, but it can never tell society what should be done. So for an example, uh, should raw milk be legalized? It is not legal in Iowa. And I would say about every year, there's a debate on campus between two sides that say, we should make it legal. No, we should make sure it stays illegal. And what you see is how the values come into play. So the science says drinking raw milk significantly increases the risk of foodborne illness. Okay? So one side says, okay, I have a value of keeping people safe. That's my value. So what this science says, if people, greater chance of getting sick, we obviously should not make it legal to sell raw milk because I want to keep people safe. The other side says, okay, I'll, I'll give you that science. I will agree with that science. But my value is freedom of choice. So the fact that it's more likely to make people sick has no basis on whether, let people decide if they want to step into that risk. So we have the same science, people are agreeing with the facts, but because of these underlying value systems, it pulls them apart. So audiences are not passive. They will seek out and interpret science according to their values. When these values remain hidden or unspoken, science issues become infused with antagonistic cultural meaning that inhibits discussion. And so the only way to deal with this is to get down to what these values are. So going back to this petition, so I, I showed all those facts, but you don't have to look very far before you start to see these values coming out. This is why these people are mad. It's really, yeah, they're, they're saying facts, but it's for Caitlin, which is the student who started it. It's what she stands up for, what she believes in. This is for the future of strong bonds between the American consumer and American farmer. That's a value. There's some people that would not support that. Those who didn't grow up on a farm looked down on us who did. This disconnection needs to be fixed. Okay, I think that's very sad. I mean, that makes me sad that that person feels that way. But that is a value. And so those are the things that are driving people to apply the facts in certain ways. So this is a different model. And this is the model I want you to think about. It's called the public engagement of science model. Under this model, controversies are not bad. They represent a necessary function of democracy. But the role of communication is to make sure that those discussions and those value fights are using the correct information. So we have accurate scientific information getting into this process, but then let's let the values and everyone debate on how best to apply that science to move forward. And I like this quote. In other words, we may be wasting valuable time and resources by focusing our efforts on putting more and more information in front of an unaware public without first developing a better understanding of how different groups will filter or reinterpret this information when it reaches them, given their personal value systems and beliefs. So there's lots of different ways to measure values or try and conceptualize what they are. This is one, this is Schwartz's values. Um, this is one, height. He splits it between liberals and conservatives. But the one I want to touch on real quick is called the cultural theory which says a lot of conflicts about science are not really disagreements about the science, but they are different ways of aligning what that person thinks is the desired social structure of the world, what, what the world should be. And so individuals select, selectively attend to and interpret information to represent and reinforce this way of life. Okay, I'm watching time here. So it splits people <coughs> into four quadrants based on two axes. If we had more time, I could give you all a quiz and we could find out which quadrant you are in. But you can figure out based on this what it is. Okay, x-axis is called group. It's how much do you identify as an individual versus how much do you identify yourself as the community you're in. So if you are low on group, it means that you think of yourself as an individual. I make decisions and I do things. And as you get higher on group, you start to say, well, this is, this is what the group is doing, and they have a big influence on me. You can even hear it in the pronouns people use. Here's what I'm going to do tonight versus, oh, did you hear what we did? I versus we. There's also grid. How much structure do you think society should have? 
So if you're low on grid, you think everyone's about the same. We're all about the same. We all put our pants on one leg at a time. That saying that we all have different roles, but we're all fundamentally the same. As you get higher on grid, you start to say, you know what, we need a hierarchy. We need structure. So there needs to be people in charge. They need to be able to tell people under them what to do. Um, and we need this authoritative truth in order for society to move on. And so you put those together, you get these four quadrants. If you're low on group, low on grid, I'm an individual, we're all the same. I'm an individualist, so we're all working together, we compete, and that's what makes society work. If I'm still low on grid, so we're all the same, but I think of myself as a unit, as the community, then I'm an egalitarian. We all need to work together, we all need to do a little to solve these problems. If you are high on group, meaning I identify with my community, but we need a lot of structure, you become a hierarchist. So we need to have this structure in place. And if you are low on group, I'm an individual, but you're high on structure, you can become fatalistic because I'm by myself stuck in a structure and I can't really do anything. So to show how this is useful, let's take a topic that comes up a lot, sustainability. There's lots of groups trying to push sustainability or describe what it is, but each of these values are gonna think of sustainability in a different way. So if you are in the egalitarian side, Greed has destroyed shared resources. We need to return to smaller institutions, simpler lifestyle. Everybody should do a little, and we can solve this problem. If you are more of a hierarch, it's a lack of order that has destroyed shared resources. We need new organizations, new rules, enforcement. The authoritative truth needs to be accepted, and then we can fix this problem. If you are an individualist, it is unnecessary social burdens that have destroyed resources. We need more freedom to allow solutions to arise from competition, and that's how we can fix it. And if you are a fatalist, destroyed resources are inevitable, all other groups have failed. <laughs> Stop trying. <laughs> so the, the moral is that the audience is not just sitting there waiting for information to come to them. They've got a value system that is, they're going to use to seek out information. They're gonna apply whatever those facts are to support that value that they've got. And so messages must be interpretable according to, the, to their values. It doesn't make science communication easier, makes it much more difficult, but it will make it a lot more effective. So I want to challenge you, because you are not immune to this. You have values too. So what values do you use to interpret issues surrounding antibiotic use and resistance? So think about some fact that has meaning to you. So if you really want someone to know something about AMR, what is that fact? And then, well, why is that important to you? What is the value that that supports or that represents? Because that's what, what's driving your orientation. And then think about what are the values driving social misunderstanding or controversy about antibiotic use and resistance. So it's not just that there's a misunderstanding and I need to correct it. What does that misunderstanding represent? Why is that person focused on that and holding on to that? Because that's the only way you can change it. So again, this is just one part of communication. Values are one, but there's all these other ones. What's your goal? What's your audience? Why should they care? Um, how to reach them? What, how to earn their trust? We've heard trust a lot, and I know there's a panel tomorrow on trust as well. So that's just one part, but thank you very much. I look forward to your questions.